listen Lassie and listen good. I'm not saying he's not going to get married. I'm not saying he's not even going to have kids. But if it does happen, one day his wife's going to come home and find him with his Tijuana lover clubbing each other to Yanni's greatest hits. Welcome in to the Bro 4 Squad podcast, where we're just a bunch of bros drinking beer and watching movies. I am your host, the Mayor Jeff Hornacek. This is episode 121. And before we get started with the movie discussion, thank you guys for checking us out. And let's meet the fellow bro joining me tonight. It's actually kind of like your your show tonight, Matt. Um, it's the show the fans have begged for on their knees, pleading, you know, give Geiger a full show. And we're finally listening to him. A plethora, a smorgasbord, if you will, Jeff, of fans. Let's hope this turns out better than, than that Joey spinoff from Friends that they tried, where they gave him, like, his own half hour. It, it'll be just as good as that, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our enforcer in the paint, Matt Geiger. Matt, my question for you tonight, if you had to pick anyone from the pod to fight in a battle to the death, who would it be and why would you choose me? Well, it wouldn't be Thurman because he just beat me in golf this week. Uh, it wouldn't be Banner. Um, Cycli would just sue me after I won. So, yeah, Jeff, it would be you. Um, I, like I don't know. We just really don't get along stuff. off pod. We haven't, we haven't even talked off pod for months, so... No, this whole just, thing is actually being done. We're recording it to, to Banner, and then he has to edit it all together. Yeah. We actually don't like each other as much as you guys probably think. Every year I get mad at Christmas present. When he opens it up, it's just a brick, like Michael Scott got <laughs> white. He's got 11 just of them. stuck now. on this. But Michael, that's not even my handwriting. That's, that's not what I think <laughs> that I thought that it was. <laughs> all right, well, if you have not listened to our show before, or even if you have, we start every episode off with the most important thing in any bro's life, and that is chess day. And today we have a very special segment. I'm calling it Matt's Life Through Movies and Music. Matt, why don't you tell the people what this is, how you found out about it, and then kind of the thought process behind what we're about to do. So I could lie and say this is all my idea, but it's not. Uh, During lockdowns, people have come up with a lot of surveys, mainly with music, but we're going to do them with movies as well. Uh, Guilty Pleasures favorite band ever that that kind of stuff just to gear up conversation and shit because we're all bored as hell and we don't really want um the light shined on how effed up the world is right now so we decided to do it on the bro four squad you can listen to me right now and banner maybe next week jeff after that we can get thurman on and cycle and all your favorite bro four squad characters to answer these tough questions no not if you know california should open fully but what band do you think is overrated? <laughs> so we're going <laughs> to... The real hard stuff. We're going to do this, uh, especially when right now we don't really have much movie news or anything to talk about because nothing's coming out. So uh, we'll do this, and please comment below if you think I'm fucking insane or I finally have pled your truth all these years. And send in your answers to these questions. Absolutely. So we've, we've divided this up into two parts. For chess day, we're going to do uh, the movies portion. And then at the end, for Do You Even Lift, Bro, we'll have Matt do the music portion. So these are 11 questions about um, the mediums, the respective mediums that basically define the formative years of your life. So we'll dive right into it. So our first question for the movie portion, Matt, is what is a movie that you can't stand? I'm going to come in hot the first two, actually. But uh, the movie I can't stand is actually movies, and it's any James Bond movie. I just don't fucking get it. Even Casino Royale that everyone asked me to watch, I will admit that I think Daniel Craig is my favorite James Bond, but they're like, oh, Geiger, you like gambling and shit like that? You'll love this movie. I just don't like James Bond. I don't get, you know, maybe people say the same thing to me about Batman. Whenever they reboot Batman, I'll be like, man, I'm interested. I just fucking like Batman. I just, I didn't know there was that big a pool of people that like James Bond. I can't stand any of these fucking movies. Goldeneye, I know we'd have a commentary on that. I don't know if it's out yet or not. I wasn't privy to it, but I know the game was pretty cool, but Pierce Brosnan, even Sean Connery, I can't stand any James Bond. Maybe I'm just not a spy guy. I just, all these movies, whenever... I'll try to watch them, especially the Daniel Craig. I've tried to watch each of them, and I think they fucking suck. To me, they're fine, but I think James Bond is kind of like Dave and Buster's. Like, if you describe it to someone, you're like, that sounds fucking awesome. And then you get there, and you're like, oh, this place smells like piss, and everything's like $80 to play. It's not as cool as I thought. 
And I'm trying to think off the top of my head, Jeff, any spy movie I really like. I like Ocean's Eleven and really a spy movie. It's more of a heist movie. So I don't maybe I just don't like spy movies, but he's like the king of spy movies wherever Whenever you reboot James Bond, some people get excited. I'm just roll my eyes. I'm just like, uh, again, why are we trying to do this? And we, you have been very candid and transparent from the beginning that Geiger and the British don't get along. We just don't. don't. We don't see eye to eye. I don't think we ever will. <laughs> They've apologized, and you said, "I don't want to fuck." I don't you. think we're gonna walk in a room with a six pack and come out, you know, just ruffling each other's hair and be like, "Yeah, it's my fault." No, it's your fault. You know, I don't think that'll ever happen. <laughs> All right, uh, the second part of the movie portion. What is a movie that you feel is overrated? Okay, this is also, I believe, a trilogy. Uh, this might get some people pissed off, but, you know, you asked me. So I love gangster movies, especially Pacino, De Niro. The oh, Godfather. don't say it. Overrated. <laughs> oh, shit. It's so fucking overrated. <laughs> it's, it's, it's time. That, like, I mean... If you want to watch a fucking movie that's like, this came out a couple years ago, didn't it? It's that one. And I know it's probably got one of the greatest actors ever. And then some of the young up and comers are the guys I just named, but I, I can't fucking get through it. It's fucking terrible. It's not good. And anyone's like, man, you love Goodfellas. You love Casino. You love all that shit. You love The Departed. You'll love The Godfather. That's the OG. And yeah, I respect the, that The Godfather, if it didn't happen, these movies wouldn't happen, but it's not that good. I, I, and some of the people say it's like, I think, what is it, Godfather 3 is the greatest movie fucking ever? The no, second it's not. One, yeah. People hate the third. The second one, okay. What's the line? It's you not. Seen the, it's not. Have you seen the family guy where the Griffins are all like stuck in their um, panic room when someone breaks into their house and Peter starts talking about the Godfather? Did not like the Godfather. It takes an hour and a half getting in. It insists It, it does. On it takes forever to get in. Like, when I watched the first one, and I was in a mood that I'm like, okay, I'm just going to chill and watch this. It'll probably start slow. But then I'm like, what the fuck is the deal with this thing? Like what? I mean, Scarface, at least it has an awesome third act where he shoots fucking everyone and does blow. I mean, Scarface, I can maybe even put in this maybe a little overrated, but the third act fucking takes it over the top. These three are just fucking slow and boring and, you know, just Peter, eat your pasta. If you're extremely Italian, maybe I get it, but... Other than that, it's it's overrated to me. Peter Griffin says it insists upon itself, Brian. And Brian goes, what does that even mean? I, I'm glad. I think I'm <laughs> going to have a very small cult group that agrees with me and a lot of people that think I'm fucking insane. And I might have just lost my my film. I can't even fucking... Uh, I, I bet I, some people probably won't even want me to review movies anymore because <laughs> I think that, but I don't care. <laughs> I well, just don't get it. You know what is kind of crazy, though? So the the question is, movie you think is overrated. Based on the reputation of the Godfather trilogy, they could still be good movies and be insanely overrated because people talk about that like it is the greatest piece of filmmaking ever. Right. Made. I'm not saying I, I, I should have I, it, It's not a big piece of shit. Whenever I watch it, though, I just don't understand. It's like, people think this is like some it's of the overrated. greatest fucking film ever. I'm like, yeah. no, it's not. I think that's <laughs> defensible and overrated. All right, the question number three now, Matt, on the flip side of that. What's a movie you think is underrated that people just don't I'm gonna give, give two. Respect? I'm yeah. going to give two because they're to two totally different movies. One is a comedy that should be on the Mount Rushmore of comedy. And I'm saying it's not even on fucking TV. It's from the creators of some of the greatest comedic ever, and that's Basketball. Basketball is one of the greatest fucking comedies ever. And it's from... The creators of South Park, so it's not like a cult, you know, it's one of their, for, I think Orgasmo is their first movie, Basketball is maybe their second, but especially the way sports before is. Was Basketball Bigger, Longer, and Uncut came out? It was like really I, Yes, close. yeah, it was. I okay. believe so, yeah. It was and probably not, South Park, like season two or three, whenever Basketball came out. Because he does uh, the cult in it, and you're kind of like, oh yeah, that's Cartman's voice. Yeah. yeah. Reggie Jackson's in it, and just the way sports is today, how it's all about money, and they change like cities and players names it's fucking hilarious i i don't know why it's not on tv number two which i don't know if the movie should have been up for the oscar but jake gyllenhaal should have been up for best actor and that's southpaw and everyone's on creed's dick right now southpaw is head and shoulders better boxing movie than creed period and if you haven't seen it the uh rachel mcadams only in it for a little bit spoilers the kid in it we always talk about how you know, getting a good kid actor is hard as fuck to do. She is fantastic in it. Hall had to get in crazy good shape and then probably gave the acting performance of his fucking life. That movie 
also on FX. You see Creed all the time, but you never see Southpaw. It is, I think it came out maybe a year before Creed when the boxing kind of craze came back. But I always thought Southpaw, that was an Oscar snub for. And uh, the director, I believe, was Kurt Sutter. who Same, did Sons of same year as Creed. Same year as Creed. So that's what sucks if, like, you come out the same year as Creed and you're, like, a boxing movie. It's like, well, fuck, dude. We just planned this wrong. Southpaw is such a better movie. It's so I actually good. have not seen Southpaw, but I remember you raving. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oscar snubbed that year for sure. All right. Piggybacking off of that, number four is a movie that you love. Point Break. I fucking love this movie. Anytime it's on, I'll watch it. And if you're at home um, asking which Point Break, fucking unsubscribe yeah, from us. Yeah, like, like you see, you must have not <laughs> listened to us too much. Uh, I fucking love Point Break, and especially, you know, um, and Banner's big on this too. I mean, obviously, Christmas, you get out your Christmas movies and stuff, but this is a fucking Memorial Day weekend movie for me and a Labor Day weekend for me. It, it rings in the summer, and it ends the summer for me. This is a movie about summer, which is my favorite time of year. I mean, Keanu Reeves, fucking our God, Patrick Swayze's in it. It's about surfing and bank robbing. I mean, how, how can I say it's more? And it's just an easy watch. Like, if you're going to eat some tacos and drink a six-pack, you know, just like uh, we watch uh, Ask Kevin L. Johnson, if you haven't checked him out from Ozark, he was on the pod. You know, what's a, what's a fucking movie you can eat pizza to and drink beer to? Point Break is number one on everyone's list, or it should be. Movie Cy- I love. Cycle Cy- 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 mentioned several years ago how his like put me in a better mood movie was aladdin that's what point break is for me man if i'm having just like a shitty week oh, shitty yeah. couple weeks put point break on it'll make you it'll just put you in a much better mood all right number five a movie that made you fall in love with film or fall in love with movies so i'm guessing this might either be one from when you were a kid or maybe one of a movie that you saw and you were just like oh shit that's what filmmaking is <sighs> This is tough, but I'm going to it's from when I'm a kid and it's Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Oh, yeah. I had it on VHS. It was fucking I fucking love that movie. I had the Robin Hood Treehouse. I had uh, the bow and arrow that I bought from Pomida. I don't know if any of you Midwest kids remember what the fuck Pomida was. It was a redneck Walmart that you could also buy toys from. I had the sword from Pomida. And uh, I remember I. I jumped off um, our mantle because I was trying to be Superman and the mantle came down and busted that VHS and it busted all of our VHSs. And my mom let me buy one VHS, you know, because I busted all of them and I bought that VHS again because I fucking wore it the fuck out. Robin Hood Prince of Thieves is a movie that just, it made me fall in love with fucking movies. Cause I'm like, dude, this is awesome. He, he basically, he killed everyone. He killed the whole town. He took it over. He got the chick. I mean, what else? I mean, what else could you teach a young boy, a young Geiger? <laughs> I was just you know, wondering what the world was about. You know, it's crazy. Alan Rickman as the sheriff of Nottingham. I mean, absolute scene stealer. And looking back as an adult, I might actually like him more than even Robin Hood in the movie. As a oh, kid, yeah. I didn't because Robin Hood was obviously when he split that fucking arrow. I was like, my God. And even Christian Slater was pretty Christian bro in that. Christian Slater's in that. Yeah. As Will, Will Scarlet. <clears throat> All right, number six is a movie that you can watch over and over again. Uh, it's it's got to be Tin Cup. Uh, tin, <laughs> tin Cup, I can watch. I know every fucking line, and anytime it's on the Golf Channel, uh, throughout golf season, which down in the south is pretty much 12 months out of the year, uh, Man, I love Kevin Costner. That's back-to-back Costner movies, but he plays so many different types of fucking characters. It's pretty much easy to love him. And this isn't even his best sports movie, but, you know, I, I used to play baseball. I don't play baseball anymore, so Bull Durham, I don't watch as much now as Tin Cup. Tin Cup is something I can just watch over and over again. And for people that think, like, okay, golf, comedy movie, Happy Gilmore, obviously. No, dude, give Tin Cup its che- due. Check our commentary on Tin Cup, too. Especially for a, a true golf fan, it's much more obviously real to the sport, oh, which sure. makes the humor that much more interesting. All right, number seven is a movie that changed your life. Not to be dramatic, but to be the dramatic. The Dark Knight. <laughs> the Dark Knight changed my life. Um, as a comic book fan growing up, comic book movies when i was younger were taken pretty seriously especially well tim burton took them seriously and that was about it then they were a fucking joke for a while and then x-men came and they took it pretty seriously 
Spider-Man took it seriously till the third one. And then Batman Begins came and I'm like, huh, like this has got some promise. And then when I saw that trailer with Heath Ledger and when I saw that in theaters, I was just like, Jesus fucking Christ. I remember buying, um, I don't know, Jeff, if you remember, DVDs always came out on Tuesday night at Walmart, yep. midnight. So in college, I was there at 1145, just fucking around. And then I went to Subway and ate for a while. And then once that hit the shelf, I bought it and I had a test the next day. So I couldn't watch the whole fucking movie because I need to get some sleep. So I only watched the scenes where Heath Ledger was in because I'm like, it it made me, I'm just like, this is what fucking acting is. And I'm glad someone actually took it up a level. So now anytime a superhero uh, movie comes along, they're like, we got to cast someone. Obviously no one could be better than Heath, but we need to cast someone seriously. They're actually going to take this role seriously to be Whiplash or be Dr. Doom or whoever the fuck it is. It's not a joke anymore. It's not an Arnold Schwarzenegger. Just get the hottest actor and paint them blue. And he changed all that, man. And that changed my fucking life because I'm like, damn, this is one of the best movies I've ever seen. And it's a comic book movie. Who would have funk it? I remember going to see that at midnight and walking out and being like, do I just have like the drunk goggles on? <laughs> like, was that really that good? So it was like the sure greatest. I, yeah. So just to be sure, I saw it again the next day in the afternoon and walked out. I was like, yep, that's the greatest fucking movie I've ever seen in my life. Whenever you can walk in there and just think, man, I hope he does, you know, pretty good. Or, you know, I hope we can have a conversation if he's as good as Nicholson. And you walk out and you're like, he fucking murdered Jack Nicholson. He's right. probably one of the greatest. Act. And he did a great Joker. It's just for the time. But he, I mean, he's, that was in 2008. He could have done a lot more. Oh, my God. It's great. I, I know some people are partial to Daniel Day-Lewis in There Will Be Blood. But for my money, that's the greatest acting performance I've ever seen. Yeah. All right. Number. Me, yeah. Number eight is a movie that surprised you. Uh, this is a trilogy as well. Something uh, on pod I trashed and said it was tired as fuck. Uh, Planet of the Apes trilogy really surprised me. <clears throat> when the third one came out, uh, we were going to the theaters a lot, giving reviews for you guys. Uh, Banner said he's going to see it. Uh, I think you had something to do. I'm like, I'll fucking see it. And then Banner's like, you're going to have to see the first two. I'm like, fine. The first one with Franco, I, I was like, dude, Franco's in this. This is going to suck. And afterwards, I'm like, that's a fucking great movie. That is a great creative idea, how to do that, how to start a Command of the Apes. The second one was really good, too. And the third one blew my fucking mind with Woody Harrelson. The, all three of the movies surprised me. And actually, I would say it's a perfect trilogy because all three of the movies were better than a B-. minus. I consider that a perfect trilogy. I mean, not every, not all three movies can be fucking fantastic. As long as you don't have a stinker like Spider-Man 3... If you have every if every movie is like a pretty good movie and then you have one amazing movie, kind of like the Dark Knight trilogy, you have a perfect trilogy, in my opinion. The thing I like about the Apes trilogy is that, as it should with the story, each one gets progressively darker. Like, as the Apes continue to have, yeah. a, as, the, as mankind basically has less and less hope, the movies get more and more bleak, which makes perfect sense. Check out our reviews on that. I still... Uh, I still monkey walk up to my wife with my palm out every time I want to go golfing. And if she just kind of rubs it, then I'm, I get yeah. all excited and then I just run out the door. Yeah. It means I can go play 18. <laughs> Look at the end. Oh, that's the end of the first one, right? Where he's like, can I go up in the tree? And he's like, fuck it. Go. Yeah. <laughs> go for it. Have fun. All right. Number nine is your a guilty pleasure movie. And by the way, I'm already dreading. What banner will pick for this? He's like, well, first off, Banner's I have no whole shit. list is guilty pleasure movie. <laughs> so mine was pretty easy. This is one of the first things I filled out. It's Showgirls. There's a lot of reasons for this. Uh, you listen to the pod. You know I love Vegas. Uh, Jesse was the hottest chick on Saved by the Bell to me. Um, for all the you know millennials and shit listening to us, when we were kids back in the Stone Age. We couldn't just get up our phone and type in like free porn and look at shit. So Showgirls was about as close as I could get to watch porn without my parents looking for scrambled channels or something like that. Right. It is one of the worst movies I've ever fucking seen. It actually ruined Elizabeth Berkeley's career. Like no one would hire her. But fuck, it's fun to watch. It's actually really fun to watch. And it's kind of porn. So it's a win win win. I have heard some horror stories about her experience on set. Showgirls was that movie as a kid where, like, you if you caught it from the beginning, it was, like, well, rated R for sexual situations. And you're like, well, they didn't say nudity, but that seems yeah. like it's nudity adjacent, so I'll hang out for the next two hours. Because if you got to see Nipple as a 10 to 14-year-old, it was worth writing home about. All right. Uh, Have you so ever seen it? I've seen parts of it. 
Okay. In the same yeah, everyone's yeah. only seen part. I've seen it all the way through maybe two times, which actually is probably more than anyone in the world. What's the line in Ted when he talks about Jack and Jill with the prostitutes? He's like, Adam Sandler tries to play his sister. And it's it's unwatchable, but they're prostitutes. So, uh, But they're they're prostitutes, so who cares? Yeah. Like, I'm paying them. So they have this to watch is it. Sauvignon Blanc. Apparently that's her name. <laughs> All right, number 10 is, uh, so for music, it's going to be your best live experience. But for movies, let's make it your best theater experience. Easily, man. The Force Awakens. For a multitude of reasons. And we can talk, like, this isn't about where it went or anything. And actually, if you just want to talk about the movie, period. After The Force Awakens, if you want to tell me it's a ripoff of The New Hope, Okay, but the New Hope was awesome. So way to rip off something that fucking worked before. Right. But seeing this a couple weeks before Christmas, Christmas shopping with my wife and my parents, and my parents who got me into Star Wars because they had HBO and they illegally taped everything on HBO, and that they who got that's who got me into Star Wars. And telling my dad, I was like, let's go see The Force Awakens tonight on opening night. Like, Harrison Ford's back. I think Mark Hamill's in there, Carrie Fisher. He's like, okay. He's like, I thought the trilogy were fucking stupid, but I'll watch it if Harrison Ford's in it. And going there, sitting in the front row with our 3D glasses, my mom's never seen a 3D movie before. And my parents both saw Star Wars in theaters in the 70s and 80s. So oh, that's cool. that with them and having generations match like that and seeing my mom, like, grab the screen when a ship was coming at her and stuff. <laughs> was like the coolest fucking thing ever. And having Harrison Ford come on where my dad's like, this is kind of boring. This Kylo Ren guy's kind of a bitch. He's like, okay, Harrison Ford's on a man's on. Finally, I'll fucking watch now. It was, it was like the funnest theater experience ever. Um, and it actually was a good, it didn't, that movie didn't piss anyone off yet. I feel like it, if you're a real star Wars nerd, you can get, you can get nitpicky, but you didn't leave there. Like I want to fucking kill myself. And it was an awesome theater experience. Two weeks before Christmas, opening night, never seen a 3D movie for my mom. My dad hasn't seen a Star Wars movie in theaters since the 80s, and you guys see it with him. It was fucking awesome. I think people like now that nitpicked or were mad about The Force Awakens when it came out after the rest of the sequel trilogy <laughs> came out, they were like, that one, I remember we were a little bit hard on it, you know? But yeah, I agree. There is nothing, <laughs> there is nothing that equals that experience when like, there's a little bit of snow on the ground. You're back home with your family and you go to the theater to see a movie together, let alone one like this that was literally bridging the gap of generations. And remember, <laughs> as kids, because the prequel trilogy, like you said, was so poorly received, I was like, dude, I don't think we're ever getting sequel movies. And we well, got that. That's like a person in 2020 that was upset that the NBA season was canceled due to COVID. We're like, just wait. There'll be a lot more stuff canceled. Like, <laughs> like you, I got, like, we thought that travel. was the worst thing that could ever happen to us. Someone from the future says, oh, honey, sweetie. Okay, yeah, no. Let's <laughs> save some of that matter. rage. Save some of that rage. All right, that concludes the movie portion of Matt's Life and Movies. Stay tuned for our Do You Even Lift, bro, where we will do the music part. But first, we go on to our protein shake, where we talk about what's in our cup, also known as what have we watched lately. Matt, I know we're going to save the one we watched together for the end. I have five things, but I'm only going to talk about like two of them. So I'll get a couple of these out of the way and then toss it over to you. I have two. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I have two. Well, I'll, I'll let you sandwich in between. Yeah, go ahead. That works. So uh, Banner and I last night watched and did a movie commentary on the original Godzilla from 1954 which is in black and white and on HBO Max. And I Some think kid right now is like the one with Matthew Broderick. I'm like, no, 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 no. There was one before that <laughs> child. They have the like original. four, four of the like original Japanese ones on there and they get so ridiculous. Like there's one that is Godzilla versus Mecha Godzilla, which is where the humans try and build their own robot Godzilla to fight back against him. And Godzilla doesn't fucking like that idea. That's Makes but, sense, kind of, though. <laughs> but we watched the original from 1954, and I won't say much about it because when our commentary drops, like, that's the real place to get our thoughts. But I'll say this. This thing is a fucking blast to watch. And what makes it even more fun is Banner was watching it on a tablet that was actually – because HBO Max, as of this recording, still cannot fucking figure out a deal with Amazon to get their shit on the fire stick. So he has an Amazon tablet – and he had to illegally get HBO Max on there. And so it was cutting off the subtitles. 
So the whole movie banner is literally just guessing what's happening in the movie and is like 99% correct. <laughs> it's not even in English and he doesn't have subtitles. So Godzilla. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, it's awesome, dude. And you can see like the impact it had on movie making. Like it's 70 years old and some of the effects still look pretty good. They still hold up. Yeah, I mean, considering it's seventy I mean, years old, you gotta say you can't be the douche like this isn't realistic. I'm like, it was made in 1950. Like my my dad wasn't even born yet. Like, Japan, come on, Japan was like eleven years removed from the atomic bombs being dropped on them. Like, like can yeah. we cut them a little bit of slack? <laughs> Jesus Christ! Another thing I watched was the there's a new season of Unsolved Mysteries on Netflix. And Matt, episode three of this, you would really, really like. So the one thing that does suck about this show is like halfway through the episode, most of them, except for one, are murder cases or missing persons. And halfway through the episode, you always realize like, oh, fuck, this isn't going to get resolved because the title of the show is literally Unsolved Mysteries. Yeah, right. Yeah, you're so not going to get any closure. So you get kind of pissed off. You're like, damn, it actually was like really interested to see how this ends. But – Episode three, I actually I watched with Cycli because I went up to visit him for the Fourth of July, and it is like it's so obvious who the fuck did it, but the police just didn't fucking care and didn't look into it at all. And since this episode's dropped, they've gotten like fourteen hundred tips, and I think they're gonna make an arrest. So good on the show, but I think episode three and episode five you would like, Matt. Besides that, there's really not much there for you, but it's really fun to watch it. It's a sick fucked up world we live is in. That- is that a good thing or a bad thing? I was thinking about this earlier. Now, the cops aren't doing their job, but it takes a Netflix documentary to get the Epstein chick in jail. Like, I'm glad we have Netflix. I'm glad she's in jail, but shouldn't she already, shouldn't our legal system already do their job? We shouldn't have to budget a couple mil to do a documentary on a streaming service so people More actually, thing. like... We're getting to the point where a lead detective, they'll be like, hey, you need to follow up uh, on this lead. He's like, let's wait for Netflix to come barking. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Fuck, once man. I get some once I get some pushback from social media, maybe I'll fucking lift a finger yeah. for it. Until these that. things tend to police themselves. Like, But you're the actual police, though. <laughs> One other thing I watched before I toss it over to you. Um, this movie Palm Springs on Hulu. I don't know if you've seen trailers for this. I and, have a lot. Dude incredible was really? blown away by this so it's a it's obviously like taking the premise of groundhog day andy sandberg is reliving the same day over and over and it's a wedding that he goes to with his girlfriend who he's relived the day like a thousand times when the movie starts and first off the mere comedic premise of like being able to know everything that happens in the day and like the it's, shit yeah, it's fucking hilarious the yeah. shit he can do is awesome and he talks about like other things he's done is like one because when he falls asleep, the day resets. He's like, one day I just smoked a bunch of crystal meth and saw how far I could travel. I got all the way to Equatorial Guinea. <laughs> Pretty impressive. <laughs> and then I passed out. Does it take um, place in Palm Springs, California? Is that it why it's does. called that? Yeah, it okay. does. There's a couple twists and turns. J.K. Simmons is an absolute scene stealer in it. I all won't right. tell you much about his character. And this has the perfect combination of like heart and comedy i'm normally not a huge andy samberg guy but this was the best thing i've ever seen him in and Kristen miliotti who's the mom from how i met your mother and she was jordan belfort's first wife in wolf of wall street okay um the one he cheats on with margot robbie i mean who can blame him um she's really really good in this it's really short it's like an hour 25 minutes this was like oh man aside from extraction this is probably the most fun i've had watching a movie all year it's just I've always liked Sandberg. I just didn't like, they kind of booked him for a while. I was like, oh, you're the next Adam Sandler. I'm like, no, you can't. He's not that. He's just, I mean, he does some songs and stuff, but I never really minded him. I kind of liked him, actually. He's really good in this. It's Because it, he, he's not making a joke of the, the movie. Yeah. And I could see, like, Groundhog Day is like a perfect comedy in a lot of ways. Um, but what's cool about this is the, is the setting is different. Like the, the setting being at a wedding is just a whole nother set of like comedic opportunities that present themselves. That you just don't have it in the actual groundhog day movie. All right, Matt, I had two more things, one that we shared, but I'll toss it over to you and let you say what's in your cup. Okay. I actually, I got one more, but uh, the first thing I watched is on TNT for the first time oceans eight. And you know, I'm a big oceans 11 and 13 fan. Never seen the 12th one. If you're not in Vegas, I will not watch 
This one is on TNT. I just wanted to see what I'd think of it. It's basically scene for scene, Ocean's Eleven, like the first 35 minutes, which is Sorry. just... I saw this in theaters. I can't remember. They're in New York for this one, right? Not Vegas. Yes. Okay. And they're basically just the stealing backpack. diamonds from a fashion show, which doesn't make. I, I guess. I was, Tim Burton's I wife is the. Yeah, the yeah. Wife. There's a lot of uh, Rihanna's in it. Uh, Kate Blanchett, um, of course. Kate Blanchett uh, is like the uh, rusty character, right? I actually, really yeah. Didn't in it. Tries, well, girl, I guess. Your girl Sarah Paulson, also, right? So I liked Sarah Paulson in it. She was fine. I like her in everything. It's just, they had no chemistry, though. Um, her and Sandra Bullock. They didn't have the chemistry as Clooney and Brad Pitt, because Clooney and Brad Pitt are best friends in real life. However, anyway, they're both actors, and so are these two, but they just didn't have the chemistry, and the reason why is because we knew that they were forcing it on us so fucking hard. And then you're trying to believe that she's Danny's sister and she has Danny's watch, but Danny's dead, which is like the weakest fucking thing ever. I'm like, we can't get Clooney to unretire for maybe if this movie actually makes some money to do like a crossover Ocean's 11 with Ocean's 8. It was terrible. I liked Anne Hathaway in it because she just played kind of a prissy bitch, which I think is the only role she can kind of play. I won't spoil it, but I actually like the, the twist with her at the end. I I I didn't mind it. I just wish it wasn't an Oceans movie. It would have been good if it was just, you know, a, a, a woman's heist movie. But you always got to, you know, take someone else's fucking franchise just to get butts in the seats. I would have seen this probably in theaters if it was just a woman's heist movie. But since you're trying to fuck up the Oceans franchise, I was just kind of out on it. Uh, second thing I watched... It was on Netflix, and it was Bad News Bears. It was the um, the newest one, with Billy Bob Thornton. The first one is a cult classic. I fucking love that movie. This one even is has more racial fucking jokes. This in was it when the first like one. all Billy Bob Thornton did for like a five year stretch was movies where he yelled at kids. Yeah, like Bad Santa. And then <laughs> this one's pretty good for a remake of a classic. I mean, there's nowhere close to the original, but it's actually watchable and it's funny. Like, I was laughing through it. The kid actors were pretty good. Um, They did some of the classic Bad News Bears stuff, but then they threw some twists in that weren't, like, desperate twists. It wasn't like Disney, like, doing a twist on Lion King or something. Like, it actually made sense, and it was was a good film, man. Check it out. It's a PG-13 kind of just fun comedy to watch with a couple people. Uh, The third thing I watched... Only about three episodes of this it's on Netflix. It's called Alone. Uh, it's like it a reality. Up, yeah. yeah, it's like a reality show, I guess. But these people, and a lot of them are kind of down their luck. They need money really bad. So they just send them out in the wilderness. And it's survival of the fittest. Whoever survives last gets the money. And some of the people have to be pulled out because they can measure their heart rate and everything. And like this one guy was like, Oh, I'm going to save my food because I got to have this for the next two months because there's nothing else to fucking eat around here. And they got his heart rate. like literally your body's about to shut down. So we got to take you off the show. They're sleeping around fucking bears. Like some of these people, like they got to fish and hunt berries and shit to eat. Like if, if they like break their leg or something, like one guy broke his leg and then he had to be like, he tried to fucking tough it out, but he couldn't. It's basically, it's very interesting because their mind is the first thing to go over their body. Yeah. Always, which is a very interesting thing. Uh, whenever you see these people, it is, uh, there's one guy that only lasted two days. I'm like, dude, I could last. That's 48 hours of the world. Like, come on. You I can picture eat a the, big meal and not eat two days. I picture the office episode where Michael Scott goes into the woods and like 30 minutes in, he's already like lo- completely lost his wits. Is he getting cold out here? So uh, I'm putting my pants back on when he like with his duct tape. His pants. <laughs> yeah it's interesting man if you're into that kind of stuff it's kind of hard for me to watch because you know people are like eating meat that's not cooked and they throw up and it's but it's it's a very interesting thing like mind over matter type thing uh it sounds like i just kind of watch it but a, a real version without the team element of survivor like where you yeah. don't feel like when they yell cut there's like a buffet table and craft services yeah right yeah yeah yeah, these guys are just out there, just living. So, pretty cool thing to watch. Do you think you'll finish it, or was it not interesting enough to? It's interesting. You just got to be in a certain mood to watch it, and it kind of depressed me. But it it was more 
so it, it made me kind of think of it was like, man, it's like your mind is the first thing to go. Your body can go a lot farther than where, what your mind can take you sometime. If you can just get past that hurdle. Yeah. But that was the most interesting thing to me. It might be something good to watch. These guys are starving. So right after I make my dinner, maybe I'll sit yeah. down and have a big old steak dinner with macaroni. Like what's this guy's deal? He can't fucking last three days in the wilderness without food. Boo-hoo. Your mouth is full. Well, fuck it. <laughs> <you again. laughs> Mac and cheese is extra cheesy tonight. It's interesting. (laughs) (laughs) All right, anything else or just the thing we watched together? No, that was that was. Okay, last thing I had before we get to the Coupe de Gras. So this uh, Matt, you might want to check it out on our YouTube channel if you log in. I saved this to our uh, playlists. So it's a six-part documentary that I didn't realize came out in like early two thousands called shadows of the bat and it's about the making of the two tim burton batman films and then the two joel schumacher batman films what and they got like all the cast to be interviewed and like the warner brothers studio each episode is like anywhere from 20 to 25 minutes so the whole thing is like about an hour 45 minutes but i had some highlights i mean you and i obviously have watched all these movies probably 40 50 times absolutely Check out our commentaries on Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. Yeah. But there was some interesting stuff that I'm not sure if you knew. So just a few notes that I wrote down as I was watching. And again, I think this is definitely worth you checking out. Because you can watch it in the – because of the six parts, you can just – it's easy easy chunks to get through. First off, Annette Bening was originally cast as Catwoman. But a week before filming for Batman Returns started, she got pregnant. So she had to drop out. What else is she in – She's in American Beauty. She's the mom. She's in... Okay. Um, yeah, she's in a lot of stuff. But if you saw her, you'd recognize her. She was a bigger deal in the mid-90s. But Michelle Pfeiffer talks about how like she basically just agreed to do it. She didn't even know the, what the fuck was going on because they needed her to fill in a week in. A week before shooting. Uh, Chris, Chris O'Donnell, who of course played Robin in the Schumacher Batman, said that he didn't like Batman Returns because it was too dark. Okay, bro. Well, who the fuck asked him? Yeah, I was like, yeah, let's just uh, let's go with your movies instead. I just thought that was funny as I watched it. I'm like, I mean, I guess he has to say that. Actually, no, he doesn't have to shit on the other Batmans. He could find another way. Not, <laughs> no. not really at all. No one asked him, so. Another thing that was cool, so Bob Kane, of course, the, the guy who created Batman... There's a clip of him on set for Batman Forever, and at this point, he I think he passed away shortly after the movie was released, or maybe even before no, it was released. it was Batman and Robin was the last thing he saw in theaters, because I remember talking about that on our commentary. Fuck, oh, that's, that would kill me too. <laughs> so, but, he, but the footage, so he shows up on set, and Joel Schumacher is sitting there, and he brings Joel, Sch- I don't know if he was just busting his balls, or if he actually didn't like Joel Schumacher, but... Bob Kane hands Joel Schumacher a comic of Batman. And Joel Schumacher says to him, is this signed, Bob? And Bob Kane says, well, of course it is. Don't you know how to read? (laughs) Because his name was written on the front of it. And Joel Schumacher laughs it off. I'm like, he might just actually fucking hate you because he sees what he He probably just wants, it's like, hey, this is what you're supposed to do, by the way. There's actually a lot of these if you kind of want to follow any of them. But. If you'd like to check them out, or if you just want to take a shit on my legacy, you can go ahead and do that. Too. <laughs> All right, now Akiva Goldsman was the screenwriter who wrote uh, Batman Forever and Batman and Robin. And this guy's not a total hack, because I, I looked it up. He also wrote A Beautiful Mind, that Russell Crowe movie uh-huh. that was nominated for Best Picture. So he has talent, right? Again, I will never criticize you for chasing a paycheck. What I will criticize you for is if you act like I don't know you're fucking chasing a paycheck. Okay? <laughs> don't, don't defend it. That's right. Yeah, don't defend it. So I have two quotes from Akiva Goldsman, again, the screenwriter of both the Schumacher Batmans. And both of these, when I heard them, I, I out loud to myself go, what the fuck? No. <laughs> All right. So the first one, he's talking about Batman Forever. And he said, quote, Batman Forever is essentially a retelling of Batman's origin story based on Batman Year One. In what universe? (laughs) Not at all. They reference his parents one time in a therapy session. Batman Year One, he's like 18 years old. Yeah, and Robin's in this one, and he's fighting 
two faced, which wouldn't even be a thing. He'd be Harvey of, Dent. That makes none of it makes sense, like at all. Literally, the only similarity is unless Bat- he went through counseling in Batman Year One and fell in love with his therapist. Maybe I, I don't. But to know say what it's his origin story, like he's they, he's already been Batman for like ten years in the movie. Like, what do you mean it's his origin story? <laughs> And then this one, Matt, especially since you referenced The Dark Knight earlier, this one, like, I was losing sleep over how fucking absurd this quote is. So Akiva Goldsman defends Batman and Robin saying, and I wrote down this exact quote, saying, quote, the reason a character like Batman is iconic is because you're able to contort them and present them in such different ways. If we hadn't tried to stand Batman on his head and saw that he fell over, the world wouldn't have gotten something like Christopher Nolan's take on him. <laughs> so he's taking credit for the Dark Knight because it's because of us up. that you had the Dark Knight. You're welcome, by the way. Oh my that, god, dude. that is why that is why Hollywood like no one believes anything they say because they're just so <laughs> high on themselves that they're like, dude, no, it's terrible. Uh, I will admit that you have talent, but you got to admit that you sucked at this. So. That would be like you cheat on your girlfriend and then she ends up meeting her eventual husband and you're like, you're welcome. Like, do I not get a well, gift? It's because that I banged so many chicks when we were dating behind your back that you're married now. So. And one last thing, I actually didn't even have this in my notes, but so rest in peace, Joel Schumacher. He had a quote at the end of this that I thought, to my point earlier, was the most honest thing you could possibly say. And he says, the studio wanted both of these movies to be, for lack of a better term, toy addict, meaning like more toys, yeah. more And he said, and I do, I think the script suffered. Yes, but I knew what was going on. I knew the compensation involved and I take full responsibility for that. And to me, that's the best thing you can possibly say. We give Joel Schumacher a lot of shit, but I don't think we ever blamed him because dude, if he's not going to do the toy thing for Warner brothers, guess what? They'll get rid of him. Just like they got rid of Tim Burton who gave them two movie golds that everyone fucking loved those movies. It's actually somebody else that will. So at the, I think it's part three or four when they're talking about um, Batman forever starting to shoot. And Joel Schumacher says he called Tim Burton. He's like, Tim, I had a lot of respect for him and I didn't want to take this movie if he was still considering doing a third one. And Tim Burton was like, Oh no, I, I read the script. I have zero interest in that. That is all. (laughs) (laughs) It's like, I could not be, it's like if you broke up with a chick two years ago and like, she's not looking so great now. It's like, yeah, it's like, no, I've, I have zero interest in that ugly scam. But you have fun. She's good for you. She's so great. You guys could be great, yeah. So I thought that part was great. And if I'm Joel Schumacher, I'd be like, should I be worried that you were like so adamantly not wanting to do this movie? Almost Batman laughing. Forever can be argued that it's not that bad a movie. Yeah. Even I agree. though Jim Carrey and Tommy Lee Jones overact through the whole fucking thing, but Actually, I think you would like in this Tommy Lee Jones quotes about it. He basically blames his fucking kid for why he took the role. He's like, kid, my, like, made him. he's like, my son was like, you can't turn down Batman and Two-Face. He's like, and when I showed up, I'm basically just like entertaining kids in line for a ride at a theme park. Yeah. Uh, Tommy Lee Jones, fantastic actor. At the time, we thought all Jim Carrey could do was overact. Uh, time has proved that's wrong. He's also a great actor. Mm-hmm. So sad. If they were in the Nolan universe, these two could probably give like Oscar worthy fucking performances, just like Heath Ledger, just like Tom Hardy. But. They didn't get that chance, so. And I'll say this, man. Every actor like that's worked with Joel Schumacher loved him. Like even George Clooney was like, dude, he was so much fun. He was an actor yeah. director. Like he had a great welcoming set. It's just at the end of the day, when you're making an hour and a half, hour forty five minute toy commercial, what the <laughs> fuck else are you supposed to do, really? But he admits it. He was like, dude, I knew what I was doing, and I I take responsibility. I took the paycheck. I can't for it. believe Clooney survived that. If it wasn't for Ocean's Eleven, he wouldn't have. They had to do like a Michael J. Fox and Back to the Future type filming schedule. He shot ER from like 8 a.m. to 4 and then would come in and shoot. If I think he actually says every scene of his in Batman and Robin is an interior shot because everything was in the middle of the night. Like they're indoors for everything, which is pretty crazy. All right, last thing, Matt, you and I both watched. As, as you're listening to this, too, I believe the show's finale will have aired or at least the next episode. But Probably, yeah. Labor of Love on Fox, which Matt and I are obsessed with episode seven aired last week matt before we get into it even if you're not watching the show i still think you'll find this entertaining why don't you give people like the elevator pitch on what the premise of labor of love is if they haven't seen it christie's 41 or 42 or something 
She's been married once. Uh, she wants to be basically the bachelorette. However, she doesn't want to st- just get married. She wants a guy that's ready to have kids right now. So once she picks a guy, I mean, if they get married, I don't know if they're going to get married, but she wants to fuck and have a kid because her time is about up. I don't even know if they'll date, depending who wins. I don't know. But this last episode, Matt, we were down to three guys, Kyle, Stewart, and Marcus, and we did Hometowns, which obviously if you watch The Bachelor or Bachelorette, you're familiar with, where <laughs> the three finalists take Christy to their respective hometowns to meet their friends, their families, or in Marcus's case, who the fuck knows who that woman is in his house. <laughs> Now, I know you have a ton of thoughts. I just have a few talking points I want to get your opinion on first. Okay. So we'll go in order of the, the house visit she did. So first off, Kyle, the six foot eight guy who lives in Austin. Yep. What's he a director of like sales, sales and marketing director for we don't know what it could. It could be a Fortune 500 company. It could be for shoelaces. I don't know. <laughs> so he's laying in bed with Christy. First off, why don't you talk about Kyle's apartment before we get into it much? further? Kyle's apartment. So she comes in. <laughs> First thing I see is a flag of Japan, which and which with with uh, autographs on it. Either. Like, what would he get? Like, did he see Japan play soccer in Austin? I don't fucking know. But he has a aquarium ish. It's just basically a fish tank. Uh, he's got a <laughs> it's a two bedroom apartment. He took he turned the second bedroom into his bike room, which is so bro hanging from there. But he also has like this Peloton thing that he works out with. And it's a total fuck pad, just a bachelor pad. And Christy is like, how does he expect us to, you know, raise children in this? I mean, obviously, the guy's probably like, listen, I'm not even dating anybody. Why the fuck would I need a really nice apartment or a house? I don't even know if this is where I'm going to be the rest of my life. I think if she picks him, he'll obviously say, hey, my lease is up in In three months. months. Let's go get fucking something else. But Christy just hammers this. And I think, Jeff, as we see the show go on. Christy is really uppity. Yes. I mean, she's from, she lives in Chicago. She likes the finer things in life. I mean, what 41 year old doesn't, I guess if you have, if you, if you put all your life into your career, you're probably making some money and you probably want a guy that doesn't live in a one bedroom apartment with the boiler room movie poster over his bedroom wall. So, but I will say this. I think her issue is that there are things that are should not even be deal breakers that she will absolutely not compromise yeah. on. Like if she sees something that's a bit alarming to her, instead of even bringing it up, she's like, oh, well, that's, that won't work. I don't like those tablecloths. So she what won't are we even do? like just say like, well, well, do you expect to raise kids in here? And he'll probably laugh. It's like, no, absolutely not. My lease is up in a couple months. I'm actually looking at this other place. Um, so I, going on to the other guys, though. I mean, they had way nicer places, but I think he's out of it. Just Kyle? Of yeah. Okay, well, we'll get to why I think he's still alive, because someone else had an epic meltdown. Like, I'm talking Atlanta Falcons against the Patriots in the Super Bowl-type meltdown. But there's a quote from Kyle that I loved when he's laying in bed with Christy. He goes, quote, I mean, to find someone close to my age who's never been married or had kids, that's like a unicorn. To which Christy goes... Oh, I thought I'm I'm been married. Did I I've not? Been. Did I not mention that? And he actually which is weird because I don't know if she has around the guys. I know she has with Kristen Davis, but I don't know if she has around the guys. Maybe she hasn't. For some reason, I thought like coming into it that was like her her profile that they were like all made aware of. But maybe like you know when they do like the bullet points on someone, hers was like been married. But maybe I'm. I, I mean, but it's just like you know any news article, Jeff. Like you read like single chick and you don't actually read the article that says has been married two times. Yeah, you probably like, just looked at her tits stuff. and looked at like, Oh, okay. She lives in Chicago. Cool. I'll be on the show. All right. Do you have fun. anything else about Kyle? Like we move on to Marcus. No, let's move on to Marcus. All I right, think so Kyle's for, out though. Well, the reason I think he's not is because Marcus is his own worst enemy here. So first off, the thing I love about Marcus is him and Christy go tour a school for gifted children and I just love the fact that Marcus is already assuming that his unborn child would be a gifted student. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, he's my kid. He's going to be a fucking genius. Like, what if he grows up and he, it comes out the womb and he's dumb as a rock? Like, I don't... <laughs> I just thought that was interesting. He's like, so I mean, getting kid? chicks around kids or dogs, I mean, you're going to get laid, so... But for some I didn't... Reason... Gifted kids, though? I don't know. I've never seen that. 
I've never seen that wrinkle, I guess, Jeff, in the playbook. So <laughs> I don't think Christy was that comfortable in Cincinnati or at the – she's no. like, the only gifted school I know is Charles Xavier School for the Gifted. <laughs> this feels much different. Now, I just want to hear your take on this. So let's talk about when Christy goes to Marcus's – that wasn't even an apartment. That was a house, right? Yeah, it was a house. So what what were your thoughts on that experience from her eyes? So he's a doctor-ish. I mean, he's not really a doctor. He's anesthesia. Uh, he basically puts you to sleep before the doctor actually doctors you. But still, you make pretty good money doing that. Because um, he's the one who could kill you a lot of times. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like, he's the one that always tells you why he's putting it in. It's like, listen, you know, it's only 10% chance that you die. So it's not that big a deal and stuff. And like, yeah, he's that guy. Um, so you go, you go to his house in Cincinnati and he has a house mom. It's not his mom. It's not his aunt. It's not any relation. He just has a house mom because apparently a single guy just working a job, and I know doctors work a lot of hours, but still so, so do fucking bartenders, can't handle laundry and dishes and, I don't know, paying the light bill on time and shit. So he has a house mom that does it all for him, which is weird upon itself, but then the house mom, apparently he treats like a mom that he's really close to and like a mama's boy, which is double weird. And then he does like a fashion show, Jeff, where he puts on green jeans. So weird. No traditional colored pants. The weirdest thing about the house mom is that I, and this is what I think freaked Christy out because everywhere else she went, she got to meet people's friends or family. I think that is the closest person in Kyle's life and he pays her to be there. James McAvoy from Split would have said, this guy has, I think, a couple personalities. This yeah. is weird. Yes. Like, uh, he just flipped the switch when he was home. It was, it was almost like he just wanted to lose or something. Uh, I didn't get it, because my wife thought that he was the favorite. I never really liked him. I thought he was just kind of a snake in the grass that always tried to throw other guys under the bus. And those people never win these fucking competitions. I thought he's better than this, though. Like, he was like a fucking weirdo. This was never... a sad... This was like Rick Ankiel, like, all of a sudden losing the feel for the strikes. Yeah. It's like hard... This was Ali versus Larry Holmes when he just couldn't get his gloves up. He's just taking fucking punches We're... to the head. Tyson versus Buster Douglas. You're like, what's happening? You you were once great. I think it just shows you that Marcus is so uncomfortable in his own skin. And again, the fact that the only person that will spend time with him is on his payroll is, yeah. I think, was a huge red flag to Christie. If you're an anesthesiologist in Cincinnati and you make good money like that, you should get ass. He's just a weird dude, I think. I doubt he could take chicks home because they won't get to know how fucking weird he, and boring he is. But like, Even the weirdest person, though, Jeff, putting in the proper environment like he was in that sporting event, I think it was Atlanta Hawks game, could have a good date. It's just over time, you just can't hide his weirdness. Yeah, I mean, somebody can get hot for a game. You know, yeah. Brad Ausmus once hit three home runs in a game. So we used to think Lynn Sanity was the best point guard in the league for like two weeks. Exactly. You know? That's Happens. a great. Marcus is the Lynn Sanity of. <laughs> he is. He's Jeremy Lynn. <laughs> so I think he. Well, I mean, he actually got sent home, so he he fucked yep. up. But yeah, I get what you're saying about like in terms of going all and the way. If it was you. Before she sent you home, would you throw up that fucking Hail Mary? You you wrote that song for her. Would you fucking bust it out and just try to stay one more week? It's like a timeout, man. You can't use it when the game's <laughs> Like, no shit. You can't take them home and preheat them in the oven and eat them later. Fucking yeah. play the song. He spent all that time up in the attic by himself in his fucking wife beater perfecting that thing. I don't like Chris, know, man. He was making out with Kyle right in share, front of him. That you could share see your the gift. Window. What if Paul McCartney kept yesterday to himself? Where would the world this is like, be now? No, I don't think it's ready. I don't think the song's ready. I don't I'm know. I'm still workshopping it, honestly. I mean, my heart's partially in it, but you know. It's shit the, oh, anyway. It's fucking shit. It's rubbish, honestly. The song's taken to piss. I can't, don't even have the balls to show it. I wouldn't even show it to me, mum. All right, let's move on to Stuart. Stuart. Who, I think it's the his. Who you mean? Who? The winner, you mean? Yeah. I was going to say, gonna... it's, his, it's his show to lose. Um, one, one thing that I. I I thought was interesting him sitting with Christy. First off, Stewart absolutely knocked out of the park to home visit. I mean, everything you could have, he showed yes. her fucking expensive ass house. They could have bought. He brought over his friends. One of which could relate to Christy on uh, <laughs> like getting pregnant later in life. I mean, he's playing. That's probably not even his best friend. They're probably paid actors. It's LA. How hard would it be to find? 
Yeah, no shit. Yeah. Dude, people to come you over. Can go, you can go to a sandwich shop. Like, dude, I'll give you fifty bucks and just play this role. Like, yeah, cool. Sounds like fun. Not getting any roles anyway right now. Um, but I thought it was funny when Stuart was sitting with Christy and he asked her, "Have you ever thought about having us having interracial kids?" And she goes, "No, have you?" Which and I want yes every night. <laughs> but I want to be like, "What do you mean no? Like you understand that you and Stuart are different ethnicities, right? Like how is that not this is the point of the show is for him to get you pregnant? What do you mean you haven't thought about that? He's in the final three. I don't. <laughs> what are you thinking about? So that was weird." I'm glad he brought it up because obviously to some people you don't, you don't know if you're dating a white woman, you don't know if that's a big deal. And then when she said, wait, well, I dated a girl and her fa- her parents didn't want to meet me. And then Christy basically said, yeah, my parents, you know, they, they like reggae music. So they might like you basically or something like that. They're like, they're really like understanding. Get out situation. Yeah. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Understanding? Like, what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> So that means uh, I don't know if her parents would be too thrilled about it either. Anywho, the way fucking Stuart has done this whole show, when she first entered and everyone was like, hey, I'm this, hey, I'm this. And he's like, hey, I'm Stuart. Everyone has a drink. Do you want a drink? First off, I'm like, dude, that was fucking cool. That's how you should once. fucking do it. Then However, it he does it every fucking time she enters a goddamn room and it gets fucking old. Right. Do you want a drink? Do you want to? I can I can whip up some breadsticks in the oven too, and get you know some marinara sauce if you we want. Don't even it's have ragu, stuff but like I don't have time to actually do mom's it's recipe. It's not as tangy as what you would get at a restaurant, but I'll do my best for you. But him showing her like, yeah, this is my uh, nice apartment in L.A. Not in a. This is in L.A. Like Rodeo Drive is probably walking distance. And then he's like, listen, I know we can't raise kids here. It's Rodeo Drive. It'd be insane. But I'm going to show you a house that, honestly, if you pick me, I'm probably just going to buy from us. And then these two fa- two of my friends are going to come over, and one of the girls your same age and got her eggs frozen is in the same position as us. I mean, fuck, dude. It's like fishing this, with dynamite. It's like Will Ferrell <laughs> in the campaign after he did the debate. He's like, welcome to the fucking show. That's what, <laughs> that's what Stuart needs to tell the other guys. Can I like, say this, too? This is too? a fucking bar. I think you agreed with me on this. So when he has her in his apartment, first off, it's pretty bro to have like a wall that's a whiteboard. Like, what are you fucking Facebook? This is where you live. Yeah, Why do you have? Like, what are you? Yeah, you creating the new app? Like, you're creating a flat <laughs> bar. What are you doing? You're here? upstairs. Like, but second you're off, you're a financial it, advisor, aren't you? Or something like, or wealth management, or something wealth like management, that. Which I'm still not sure what exactly. I mean, I think he's a financial advisor, but why not just say basically that? rich people come to him and he's just like, I'll put your money in a safe stock, or you want to fucking gamble a little bit here but there's no reason to need a whiteboard for that it's all electronic well he needed the whiteboard because he ended up writing some like chain of events that leads to him and christy getting together and the fact that she saw her name written on that whiteboard like oh my god you've been thinking about me like okay i mean he i think he I mean, knows obviously that. this isn't a show that i just fucking put this on here right. so you will see it i'll tell you something about Stuart. he's a try hard but i don't think he's fake I act, right, and I believe he is 100% genuine, and that's why I, I kind of want him to win. I do I too. He, I, I, he definitely I honestly, wants it more than Kyle too, right? But the problem is, Jeff, and I know we've we uh, we've reviewed The Bachelor before on this pod. The Bachelor, I'd feel it, man. Like the Bachelorette, I'd be like, all three of these guys, she's in love with. Who's she gonna pick? She's not in love with any of these guys. No. She There's has no. Rom- she has maybe some romantic interest in Kyle, but like. If it were not on the show, they might go on two or three dates, and that might be it. But, but the kiss, every time they kiss, it's like the awkward first date kiss that like one of you doesn't want every fucking time. I, she doesn't love any of these guys. I don't feel it at all. Like, well, Chrissy's and, just kind of a wet blanket that I think she, and maybe it's just the show. She just wants to have a kid, and that's it. But I, I thought you know she'd be like, oh, I love this guy. I want to marry him, have a kid right now. Right. And so the last thing I'll say to that is, and again, Stewart's a great dude. Like, I do. I, I actually don't know how he's still single based on his like career success and his person. He seems very affable, like easy yeah. to talk to. Um, but dude, it was tough to watch at the end when he basically like begged Christy to stay the night in her hotel room. And that she's was like, like, no, I don't think so. I mean, dude, these are the last two guys. I mean, you're not gonna take them out for a test run. Like, come on. I know. Yeah, you. When I go to buy my HRV at the Honda dealership, you bet I'm taking that thing on the fucking highway. 
I feel like Dangle on Reno 911 when I'm trying to tell the prostitutes, like, listen, you're not selling it enough. Like, I I need to feel that you actually want me to put it in. Like, he's remember when he's trying to yeah. teach her on the bed when he's an <laughs> undercover cop? Employees must wash hands. That's state of Nevada law. He's like, I'm not buying it. She's like, no, you have to. No, I will pay for the consent of sex. I'm just saying I'm not buying your act you're doing. <laughs> and that's how I feel with Christy. I'm like, I'm not buying you're in love with any of these guys. I don't know what the fuck you're doing. I don't know if you're just going to take their sperm and basically do like an IVF thing and have a kid, or you're actually going to marry these dude, guys. I could see that with Stuart. And I think Christy is kind of having, you could sort of see it in her eyes, like as she's looking at the last three dudes. She's like, fuck, man, like this is it. And I'm not really feeling any of these guys. Like, it's just how it works. Sometimes the pool of dudes that they brought in, it's just not, I don't know. But also, I don't want to be an asshole. I think it's more her than the guys. I think she's I gotten a lot of pretty good guys. I agree. And I'm not saying she should settle, but I think she does need to realize, like, you're 41 and you're single. Like, maybe, you, like, maybe you're just not meant to be in a relationship. Like Kyle said, she's 41 single. There must be a reason. So he said. He's a unicorn. Which Kyle I did. fucking, I love when someone trashes the chick. Is that Marcus who said that when he left? I think it was Marcus, yeah. I love when someone trashes the chick after they leave. That's great. Like, like he's not three years younger and in the same boat and is a best friend as someone that he Show, pays. Showmanship. It's like trading jerseys in the NFL. It's what you just do now. It's a, it's a tradition. It's like the Masters. Of Unlike any other. Anything else you want to add before we move on to the end of the show and do you even lift, bro? No. Um, it's on right now, and I forgot to tape it. My wife's going to be pissed. I'll catch it on DVR. Yeah, I don't think it gets to uh, on demand till like, the next day. But no. so... Again, we're probably a week behind, but go back and catch up on the show, or either way, we'll we'll do the finale. I'm, I'm assuming it's the finale. Oh, we'll, we'll do the finale, and hopefully there's a tell-all. There better be, anyway. Or so, Yeah, even if it's 30 minutes, which actually, I, I don't need more than 30 minutes. Only 30 minutes. All right, last part of our show. Banner's not here to introduce it. It's our Do You Even Lift Bruh? So we're basically going to take the questions we started the show with, uh, and now we're going to ask them to Matt about music. So it's the movies and music of our lives the Matt Geiger edition. All right, Matt, the music or artist that you can't stand is easy for me. Luke Bryant. I actually thought this was a joke. Like some of his songs, if you just read like the lyrics, they sound like a joke, but people buy it, man. People love this bro country and I don't fucking understand it. Uh, Jeans Aldine, and a be- cold beer and all that stuff. Yeah. And like, Oh, like y- like a date where a hot, really hot chick and Daisy Dukes and a great body actually wants to go fishing, catfish dinner, and sleep with the crickets. Like no fucking woman wants to do that. If you're if you have Ugh. that woman, she has two teeth and she's morbidly obese. There's no fucking woman that likes to fucking do that shit. And if you do like a woman that likes to four wheel, growing up in the Midwest, just wait a couple years. She will be either no teeth or obese. I just don't get the bro country. Jason Aldean was a close second, but there's actually maybe two songs I can stand with him. Luke Bryant, every song that comes on, if I had to listen to him the rest of my life, I would Kirk Cobain myself. I'm not even kidding at all. Bro country is like, uh, this is like their version of like Nickelback or Creed, right? Yeah. All right, second one, uh, music that you feel is or the artist or band that you feel is overrated so i went with the godfather for movies i'm gonna piss off a lot of people here and don't turn me off because i am a huge rock fan but i do not get metallica i do I, I don't get it i <laughs> i'll admit i'm gonna say once again with overrated they have a couple good songs like inner sandman i've heard it way too many times but Sabbath, True is good. The Unforgive It, I don't think that's a good song. I don't think they have the depth in their discography. Like, that's a big it, part of being an iconic yeah. band. You have, like, a string of hits, not, like, and, one. And the thing is, like, if you're talking about a great band, some of these things are the greatest rock band ever. Like, you're talking about bands like the Beatles that you could you could listen to a song from them from album album one and then listen to a one from the last album, and they'd sound like a totally different band. They evolved with the times. Metallica yeah. is just such a... Oh, oh, like I just don't get it. I love rock music, especially crazy rock music. I can li- I can work out to. I don't get the fucking deal with them at all. I never have, probably never will, and they're way overrated to me. And especially they're the ones that thought that Napster was going to be the end of music, and now fuck, yeah. how many CDs have you bought in the last two weeks, Lars? Well, the last episode we talked about how when Napster came along, they basically shifted their focus from being creative artists to trying to take down Sean Parker. Yeah, which I hated too, because they're right. like, 
someone has to stand for this and we're the biggest fan. I'm like, you're not. I just, I don't think they're that good. All right, flip side of that, uh, artist or band you think is underrated? Um, now being in the South, Red Dirt country, I don't really like to call it country. My favorite type of music doesn't exist anymore. I like Southern rock. I like Creedence Clearwater Revival. I like Marshall Tucker Band. I like Leonard Skinner. And Red Dirt Country is kind of like that. So I'm going to pick the Band of Heathens. A lot of people probably haven't even heard of them. Never That's heard of them. I tried to do one that was underrated. I actually met these guys. Uh, they played at um, a bar that I actually do some business at. Really fucking nice dudes. They How old sound are they? Band of Heathens. How old are they? I'm sorry. Are they like way older than us? Are they? No, they're like probably. They're probably like 30s. Fuck yeah. Um, and they're just. They're just rockabilly, man. They're just southern rock. They play guitar. They sing about bluesy shit. And great band. I I just kept downloading song after song after song after I saw them in concert. Um, the GM of uh, that bar, it's, it's called Love and War in Texas, if you ever want to go there. Um, she'll always kind of say, like, hey, I like I know your taste in music. You'll probably like this band. And I went there one night and saw them, and they're fucking amazing. And they even kind of dress. They're kind of like Austin-y, Austin, Texas. And they kind of dress bluesy, but yeah, they're really good. Check them out. If you like nice. Creed's Clear Art Revival and that kind of stuff, you'll like them. I do like that sound. So I'm Band of Heathens, I'll check them out. Um, you and I might have the same answer for this one whenever I go next week or the week after, but a band or artist that you love? Nah, we won't. Because I, I think I know what yours is. Mine is the Foo Fighters. I the Foo Not Fighters. a huge Foo Fighters. I love Dave Grohl I, like, as a person. I, I, I love the Foo Fighters. Um, always have, always will. Well, I think I like pretty much every song. So, and they're just they're the they're they're fun, but then they can also like you got to have a band that can do it all. I mean, the Foo Fighters can just be a dumb rock band, and they can be a fucking grunge band, or they can be you know a stadium rock band. They have songs that can just pretty much do it all. So, I'm gonna pick the Foo Fighters. All right, music that made you fall in love with music. So I'm, this could be, again, two ways. The mu- the movies one was probably something we saw as kids. But maybe for you, this was the first band or artist you listened to that you were like, okay, I actually understand now what music is as opposed to, like, kids bop. Elvis Presley. The reason why is because when I was young, uh, my grandparents listened to Elvis. My mom loved Elvis. My dad liked Elvis. And, <laughs> dude, if... If you're a guy that all the guys wanted to be you, all the chicks wanted to do you, and all the parents hated you, I mean, come on. What's more rock and roll than that? So yeah. whenever I started listening to him, I mean, I was probably two or three, and I'd be dancing around to him and stuff, and just knowing that he kind of created all this. And, I mean, John Lennon from the Beatles said it best. Before Elvis, there was nothing. And he kind of just created the superstar pop music, rock and roll. He could do it all. I, even, I like his Christmas shit. I just... I, I can listen to any type of Elvis. Now, my favorite is like 56, Heartbreak Hotel, Jailhouse Rock, that kind of type of Elvis, but Elvis Presley made me fall in love with music. Also, one of, if not the first icon to also do film and music. Yeah, he did it all. Like, successfully. And, you know, to see concerts now and everything, like, women fainted when he came on stage. Like, that's, I mean, for like, any I'm young boy. Actually fainted. Yeah. yeah. For any young boy, you want to have that effect on women. So that was fucking cool. He had the hair. He had it all. He could dance. Now, he didn't write his own music. I understand that. But for just an icon, a pop icon, I mean, he was the best looking dude with the best. He could act. He he had the voice. He had the look. He could dance. He could do it all. I'd say I make chicks faint, but usually it's just because I have too much Axe body spray on. Yeah. Which, I mean, that sounds like their problem, not mine. The right Axe body spray though could you get you laid i don't know the sense though because they're all like viking battle cries it's like (laughs) midnight midnight scream i'm like what the fuck is that smell that doesn't even (laughs) smells like rape i guess i don't know arctic shout the fuck is is that a powerade flavor Uh, what am i spraying on myself all right next one is music you could listen to over and over again this is probably like when i do this next week this will probably be the toughest one for me, it's not. Uh, for me, it's the Eagles. And this is the reason. You have a bonfire. Uh, you have a, say you're grilling for people. Jeff, say me and you are grilling. It's me, you, and Banner. But we also have um, 
let's say Banner's daughter's older. Let's say she's 15. We have your mom. We have my dad. We have uh, Banner's wife. I, it doesn't matter what age group you are. You like the Eagles. Like, that's a band that you can play at Thanksgiving, and no one will have a problem with it. Um, you know, if you play Frank Sinatra, some of the younger guys will, you know, like, what the hell is this? Or if you play Post Malone, some of the older people are like, what the hell is this shit? If you play the Eagles, everyone's like, this is cool. We can listen to this. And they have yeah, a ton of songs. Name one song. time Hotel California's come on and someone's like, go to the next song. Yeah, go to the next fucking one. Unless they're saying, like, <laughs> hey, play a different Eagles song. I've heard that one too much. Yeah. But the Eagles, I mean, you could listen to their film. Uh, once again, Eagles, I've never heard a bad song by them. And um, I'll Be Home for Christmas is one of my favorite Christmas songs ever that they sing. Bells will be ringing. Oh, yeah. That, dude. I love that, that my, fucking song. When that comes up on my Spotify Christmas list, I just stop decorating the tree. And I'm like, yeah, everyone's... Yeah, like, that's my favorite Christmas song, too. If you, That's not even on the fucking list. That's a little extra for you guys. All right, and this next one, we might go back again to Adolescent Geiger, but music, artist, or band, or actually, maybe this could even be album that changed your life. Uh, yeah, Eminem, uh, Marshall Mathers LP, probably, is the first one. I think this uh, one this... will get, albums will probably be the most common answer, right? Uh, it, it was the Marshall Mathers LP, I think the Slim Shady LP was the first one with My Name Is, and I remember buying that. And listening to it on the way home, my parents turned around and said, listen, we we got to give you the parent. We can't give you the parental advisory one. We got to give you the edited one. It's bad. But the one, the one <laughs> with, like... see, that one was, you thought was bad until the Slim Shady one came out with Kim. And that had the real Slim Shady and Marshall Mathers, like, he was new kids on the block suck a lot of dick, boy, girl groups make me, like, man, Eminem, I mean, I've dyed my hair blonde. I, I, I fucking idolized him. I, especially I growing know. up, go ahead. I was going to say, I didn't know you bleached your hair. I did. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, My mom wouldn't let me. Gr- growing up in a classic rock house where my dad liked ACDC, he liked Led Zeppelin, like the doors, anything against the establishment, against the man. And my dad, I remember when I was burning CDs, he'd be like, what's that new Eminem song? I'm like, without me. He's like, yeah, put that on my CD too. When he was giving me like a list of like Led Zeppelin <laughs> songs to put on there. I and I just song. fucking loved it. I mean, he called out Congress. I mean, he said, F you Dick Cheney, F you Tipper Gore on a song. I, I just, I fucking loved it. It was so adolescent. I grew up in the suburb. My Both my parents were together. I had a great childhood, but I just, it was just angry fucking music. And I, it just, I was like, this is what Satan sounds like. I feel wrong listening to this and I like it. Fucking loved him in it. He had like an anger, but it wasn't, it wasn't like misdirected. It wasn't like, fuck my life. Everyone feels sorry for me. It was like, okay, this it wasn't is the people. E- emo at right. all. No. It was like, I hate these people and here's why. And also in order to help articulate my point, I'm going to make you laugh as I say it. And because he, he had a comedic sensibility that I don't think existed in rap until him. Like no, like Tupac was never funny. Biggie no. was never funny. Dre was and, never funny. Well, and also none of them, like Tupac and Biggie, called out each other subtly. You know how people would be like, "Oh, that's an inside thing." He's calling out Eminem would just say, "I sat next to Carson Daly and Fred Durst and heard them who argued who Christine Aguilera gave head to for." Like he just call out people yeah. that were on TRL. And then he'd fucking accept the award and then Mo- call out Christine Aguilera again. He straight up says to Moby, you're too old. Let go. It's over. Nobody <laughs> listens to techno. Like, it's so fucking good. You just call him out. And then no one would want to call him out because it's like, how would Moby call Eminem in a techno right. song? Well, And do you really want to put the ball back in his court? He's going to fucking yeah. destroy you in his it's, next cypher worse than he did on this one. And then 8 Mile came out. And I remember seeing that movie. I'm like, God, this is great. This is fucking fantastic. And that album was fucking red hot. And then all the people, I mean, he's produced by Dre, but then all the people he produced, 50 Cent, The Game, Obi Trice, Drake, like, right? fuck. What's that? Well, I think he found Drake because he was on that Forever LP. Or at least he was one of the people that discovered him as a, an artist. He might have been. Um, I could be wrong about that, but. But I mean, the game. I, I mean, he, he was in D12, which oh, is dude, a very Mom underrated band. band. Is one of the funniest rap songs of all time. God damn it, he was great. He's still great. His new album's fun. I mean, like I said, our gener- my our parents' generation had so many people that died that they cried about. Our generation has one. When Eminem dies, I will be like, fuck. Yeah. 
His new album's red hot. I, I listened to the whole fucking thing when it dropped. I'm like, this is great. And I hate to sound like the chick in high school who, like, the like, guy with a leather jacket who ignores her she's interested in. But to me, the coolest thing about Eminem is he doesn't even fucking care. No. <laughs> He's so disinterested in, like, being a celebrity. And that makes me want to, like, him to be a bigger celebrity. And, and talk about a guy that's transformed himself. You know, at first he was kind of like joke rap, you know, like fun rap. Right. And then he could go, he could go fucking dark rap, like talk about murdering his fucking wife <laughs> with his well, he child watch. Same. He can do whatever you want. Like, what's this? Without me, and is I was without me and Stan on the same album. No, Stan was on uh, the Slim Shady LP with um, the way I am. Oh yeah. Without me he... was the one with like White America and White America. Uh, cleaning out my clo- cleaning out my closet was on that. I think Sing yeah. for the Moment was on that. But even like Stan, which is one of the darkest songs out there, uh, it's it's remixed to a Dida song. So it's like it's sort of like meta in that regard. I don't know. He's just fucking brilliant. And that LP was like the first time I realized this guy's not just another rapper. I mean, after my name is, I thought he'd be like, oh, this is good. But this is the 90s. He'll be gone tomorrow. I mean, because everybody was. And yeah. then he just stuck around and stuck around, just won everything. I we even talked to this shit like, you know, without Dre, like some of the stuff he was on that wasn't even his songs. You and I have talked about too. this a lot. The late 90s, early aughts, as Nate Thurman likes to call them, were defined by people who thought they'd be around forever and they could not have been more wrong. Yeah. Whether it's actors, musicians, <laughs> pop Smash culture. Mouth would be like, oh, 2020? Yeah, we'll probably be dropping our 10th album. Well, when you text me, like, put on the VMAs, like, when, uh, who the, was it Limp Biscuit who went up there? I'm like, dude, he thinks that the world is in his, the fucking dude, palm of his hands right now. It's like, this will never end. Yeah, they had no... My f- backwards cap and no hair with sideburns, like, and who was, was that going to get old? Who was the dude with the cornrows who had the music video up for best video that sang it shirtless that I've never even heard of? You know, that guy was like... No? No. Oh, no, I, I can't remember that guy's name. But you know what yeah. I'm talking about. That yeah. guy was like, dude, I'm just going to spend all this money because there's more coming in next week. <laughs> all right, the next one. Song, album, or artist that surprised you or that you didn't think you'd like? 30 Seconds to Mars. This is an easy one. Um, I always thought J- Jared Leto was kind of an emo bitch. And then he got cast as the Joker, and I'm like, huh, I'll have to kind of pay attention to him. Then my wife got me a birthday present. It was Linkin Park, 30 Seconds to Mars, because I've always been a oh, Linkin Park remix. fan. And Linkin Park has two awesome remix albums. The Jay-Z one. The Jay-Z the, one's fucking, yeah. That incredible. changed music, too. Uh, Is that so hybrid theory I that they to, do with Jay-Z? I think so. Yeah. I think it was hybrid theory. Yeah. There's one. I think hybrid theory is the one where it does not have a bad song at all. No. And I'm talking like. It's small. You, it's could, short, you could argue it's like, like. It's like 10 songs, right? It's a shorter album. Yeah. But you they're could, all could argue that a lot of Linkin Park ones didn't have a bad song. I'm talking like every song is like an eight out of 10, at least on hybrid theory. Like it's a fucking great album. But, uh, 30 seconds to Mars. I went and saw him in concert and goddamn Jared Leto is a showman. He put on a better show than Linkin really? Park, which was saying something because this was about a year or two before Chester died. I'm really glad I saw him, but man, Jared Leto. Fuck. I like a couple of their songs. After I went to the show, I downloaded a bunch of their albums and I like a lot more of their songs now. Um, they're one of those bands, once you see them live, you become a fan. I don't know as much of their discography as, as I wish, but uh, Jared I Leto. Either. I knew two songs, and that's it. And then yeah. some of these, I'm like, damn, these rock pretty fucking hard. And then I download some albums. Does, does Leto just do vocals, or does he ever shred a little bit on the guitar? No, he just did vocals. He played a little acoustic guitar during uh, The Kill. But Kings and Queens is my favorite song, probably. Poor ladies have no chance when Jared Leto picks up a fucking acoustic guitar. My wife loves Jared Leto. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guilty pleasure, music, artist, or band? Lance Morissette, Jagged Little Pill. I listen to this album once a month when I'm working out. Why start to finish. This, that, that this album is fucking fantastic. And see, me and Jeff will joke about this a lot because I think it's the internship where Vince Vaughn will play. It's like rain. But every song. And your wedding day. <laughs> The, every song is great. The first song, I can't remember what it's called, but it rocks pretty fucking hard. Lance Morris has a bad bitch, man. Every song on that album is fucking perfect. I and, think she was married yeah, to Ryan Reynolds when that came out, too. Yeah. Good I'm not even bannering this. I'm not lying. Probably once a month, I'll listen to that album start to finish when I'm working out. I need it's to check out some awesome. of the other songs. 
Did she uh, make it an album? I don't. If she, I mean, I, she probably had like another <laughs> single, but if she made another album, it's top heavy. But go look at Jagged Little Pill. Like, I think there's five top ten hits on that album out of twelve songs because they were all just on top charts. That's just a cool fucking album title too. Like, damn. That's when you walk by and you're like, she fucking called it that. All right, twelve ninety nine, whatever. Sure. Throw it, throw it in the cart. In the nineties, twelve ninety nine, where a CD actually has five good songs and it's not a greatest hits from a band from the seventies, is a fucking steal. I get why the music industry's pissed because we would spend that for like four or five songs before we could just download them. The music industry, we, they still owe us by getting free music. Exactly. Just and you still, you'll always have concerts, so I don't feel bad. Yeah. Speaking of concerts, Matt, second to last question: your best live music experience? I want to put the Foo Fighters on here so bad because they have a they have a known track record of being the best live thing ever. But Rob Zombie fucking kicked my ass. I, I wanted to see him for so fucking long. He comes out hitting a cowbell singing American Band. And then he starts singing a James Brown song. And just the whole show was a horror show. He had people dressed as mummies dancing around and shit. It was a lot of fun, man. I, I'm a big Rob Zombie guy. And I love a lot of his films. And... His concert did not disappoint. It was a lot of fun. It was an outdoor. You got to see him outdoor too. And uh, during, I think it was Dracula, he got a lamp, like someone, you know, from Lost, like the others. And he went out in the crowd and was just singing the fucking songs to everyone. And he had security trying to push people away from him. It was fucking awesome. It was I would be like, security, rough me up. <laughs> well, I went with, well, I went with one of our friends. His name was Rob. Uh, ironically, but he said some of these fucking idiots haven't been out of their parents' basement in years, <laughs> and it showed. Everyone's is this, pale. Is this the Rob that I know? Yes, yeah. yeah I definitely picture him. Because he, he likes them too, but yeah, man, it was it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Rob Zombie concerts, they were a lot of fun. That's fucking awesome. All right, last one, Matt. A band or artist that you should have seen live by now? Uh, I had two chances, and me and my friend were going to um, actually take a flight out to California as part of our senior basically a senior in high school to go see rage against the machine. And then we just didn't do it. I don't fucking know why. And then they were going to go see him again in a couple years ago and they were going to tour in 2020. And of course that didn't happen, but rage against the machine cannot tour right now, Jeff, because a city like you thought Minneapolis, a city would get burned to the ground. If rage against the machine toured right now with everything that's fucking going on, they, they would burn some, it to the ground. There was some tweet like, the, Rage Against the Machine tweeted something like political and someone was like, wow, not a big fan of you guys now. And someone responded to that guy like, what machine did you think they were raging against? The fucking well, toaster? The, the thing, that's the thing, man, is like, that's all they are is political rock. Right. So that, that's but, fuck, they, but they don't do it so desperately. And a lot of their songs, I'll be the first to admit, I don't even know who they're really raging against, but Jesus Christ, they're really fun to listen to, especially when you're getting ready to do cocaine or work out or fucking do something. But man, Rage Against the Machine would be insane to see live. Like that's the one I, I have always, I thought I want to see the Chili Peppers, but then I realized they just shove all their new shit down my throat. I've always wanted to see the Foo Fighters. I've seen them twice. I wanted to see Blink. I saw them with you. I want to see Rob. I saw that. I haven't seen Rage yet and I really want to. Hopefully when all this is over, they, these people just reschedule their tours and people be twice as fucking if, pumped. If Rage was touring, tomorrow i don't know if i'd go though because people would die i'm not even kidding either yeah like that's not music that people are like hey maybe we should see how other people think about this and have an intelligent conversation and maybe meet in the middle that's not music that that happens <laughs> let's to. have a healthy discourse <laughs> but why are you bringing a crossbow i bring this everywhere i go it's like let's burn their house to the ground and piss on the ashes that's that kind of music so and then we maybe, can talk later Ra rage should be social distance from people right now. And uh, that's coming from a rage fan. <laughs> Just keep them away for a while. All right, Matt, this was a good idea. I'm excited for uh, Banner and I to do this next week. So that's the movies and music of our lives. The Matt Geiger edition, Matt, before we leave the people for episode 121, any parting thoughts from you? I mean, comment below. Tell me I'm an idiot or tell me I agree. I, I like to hear because music and movies aren't, there's no formula to it. So if you, if you love Metallica, you're not wrong. You're not. It's just what you like, yeah. you know? So, yeah, comment below. if you like Luke Bryant, you are wrong. Um, but anything else? <laughs> yeah, there's one wrong answer. Yeah, <laughs> and you named it. 
yeah, comment below or play along. Put yours below. We'd be uh, happy to hear it. Especially, awesome. um, especially underrated. Because if it's a band I haven't heard, like I love listening to new music. Oh, same. Like that Heathens band I'm checking out. Right or a movie. Off here. Or a movie that's underrated that I've never seen. Check or it out. foam something. Something. I don't know. All right, for Matt Geiger, I'm the Mayor Jeff Hornacek, and we are the Bro4 Squad Podcast. Thank you guys for checking us out. Follow us on Twitter at Bro4 Squad. If you type in Bro4 Squad as three separate words on Letterboxd, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or YouTube, you'll find us there and subscribe to us and check out everything that we post. And our squad blog on our website, bro4squad.com. Till next time, we'll see you at the movies or maybe the next Rage Against the Machine concert. Shoot a crossbow at us. Right. Testify. Yeah, you agree. Sleep That's now not gonna on the be... file. <laughs> That's not going to be a concert where people are like hugging and yeah. barking a lot. You know what? Maybe I should wear a mask for your safety. No one's going to say that. I don't think. I, th- I was wrong this I whole time. Wrong. I was wrong. I was being ignorant. <laughs>